Honestly, surprised to be back, um, but thanks for having me. <laughs> this is an honor. Hello and welcome to Off the Books, where we surf the uncharted waters of accounting, finance, risk, and wherever else the waves take us. This episode is brought to you by Workiva, the one platform that unites financial reporting, ESG, audit, and risk teams for assured integrated reporting that takes the uncertainty out of, well, just about everything. My name is Steve Soder, accounting enthusiast and Diet Coke aficionado. I'm looking forward to debiting a great conversation and I'm so happy to have you with us. I am also, as always, very happy to be joined by Catherine Tsai. Catherine, can you please tell everyone about yourself? Sure, I'm not an accountant or a Diet Coke aficionado, but I like venti soy chais and asking questions of smart people like you and repeat podcast guest, Josh Gertsch. Absolutely. We are back after a break. Uh, we've probably had other episodes drop before this, but uh, we've got new music, but the same guest, Josh Gertsch, who's joined us many times. Catherine, what do you want to ask Josh about today? Well, over the last couple of seasons of Off the Books, we've talked about a lot of topics from how to recruit and retain staff, the war in Ukraine, the state of capital markets, the state of regulations for things like ESG. And you and Josh both talked to a lot of CFOs, controllers, and accounting and finance professionals which of those topics are top of mind for CFOs teams? Well, I uh, I suspect actually that all of them, t- <laughs> uh, to one degree or another, are on top of their minds. You know, Josh recently spoke on a webinar that touched on some of those things. So I think with that, we can bring him in. Josh, welcome back to the podcast with my self-esteem fully girded and intact. I am ready to engage with you. Do you want to introduce yourself for our audience? Sure. I'm honestly surprised to be back, um, but thanks for having me. <laughs> this is an honor, and I feel like, you know, a little bit rare, but yeah, I'm happy to be here. So um, Josh Gurch, um, former, you know, I'm a CPA. I practiced for years in the big four in the auto practice, and then um, I've been out in industry as a controller, director of finance, and kind of my role now is I work a lot on transactions, capital markets, and financial reporting areas. So... We've talked about a lot of topics that are uh, on CFOs' minds. Which do you think is top of mind for CFOs right now? Yeah, so it's interesting. Once it's interesting that um, you bring that up. Like uh, we recently, you know, we recently put on. um, We had a survey that we put out, and seven hundred attendees responded to it. And the question was around, like, what's the highest area of concern for your accounting finance team in 2023? And the poll results were interesting. Um, 33% of the res- um, 33% of the respondents indicated that the recession or economic uncertainty were the was the item that was most top of mind. Another 33%, almost equal to that, indicated that talent acquisition or retention was the thing that was most top of mind. Uh, 21% indicated that transformation initiatives like digitizing things, automation were top of mind. And then 12% of people indicated, or of respondents indicated that um, new regulation or pending regulation um, were top of mind. So pretty interesting results there. You know, Josh, that 12% number surprised me just a little bit. Of course, we've talked about on this podcast, and, and a lot of people are talking about the SEC's climate disclosure proposal. Um, that's been delayed at least longer than the SEC said it was going to. Do you do you think that might have something to do with why that number is low? Is because they're not worried about it because they actually don't know exactly what it is? Yeah, I I mean that's the one that stood out. To, the other ones make a lot of sense to me. The I would have thought new regulation would have almost been at the top. And I think especially when we kind of sent this survey out, it was early spring. And I think that was before the delays were there. So, yeah, I do. I mean, or probably around the time it got delayed to your point. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's interesting that that's so low. I think the timing of it has something to do with it. And the fact that, hey, we're still in a proposal phase, it'll still take two or three years to implement whatever they come out with. They're probably maybe they feel like they've got some comfort. Maybe we've been through so many of these with 606 and 842 standards that they feel like they can do it, although this is much larger than that. Um, that number shocked me. I And the other theory I have is that maybe people have been hearing about this for so long that they've already started or they've already kind of got their assessment. So now it's a matter of just kind of like finalizing the scope of it once we have a little bit more insight from where the regulators are going to go with it. 
Yeah, you know, but actually on that point, a separate survey that was done, and we can post a link to this in the show notes, but uh, a Workiva survey showed that the majority of the respondents in that case were actually going to comply with uh, climate regulations. That was said generally, so that could be referring to the SECs, uh, as well as the CSRD, which is going on in, e uh, in the EU. Of course, that actually will impact quite a few U.S. companies as well. But to your point, Josh, maybe that's it, that people have kind of resigned themselves to hey, we're going to comply with this anyway. So we don't know if we really uh, are quite as concerned with what the final thing is. We know basically what it's going to entail, and we're going to roll forward. Um, the other thing, actually, that I that I thought, just putting it into context, was the fact that talent was the same as recession or economic uncertainty. You know, you would think that with CFOs in particular would be concerned about the recession, would be concerned about, hey, what's that going to do to my results, my ability to get access to capital, whatever, and that, and that, talent has gotten so difficult that that was actually on par with what could potentially be the economic health uh, of a company. I mean, am I thinking about that the right way? That seems like that's a really big issue now. Yeah. I, I, I think my, if I were filling out the survey, I would have thought recession would have come the most. Like just coming into 2023, we didn't know what was going to happen. You kind of felt like there was something coming, but like, you know, it's hard to tell. But I think this, I think what this point really speaks to is the issue of the talent, like, and that there is such a shortage. My wife is a controller of a plant and like, they've been looking to hire just like a cost accountant, someone two, three years out of school. And they've been in the process for seven or eight months, you know, in a, in an area that's pretty, you know, that's probably pretty accounting friendly from a candidate standpoint. And, you know, to bring someone in like that, I would say five years ago, that person maybe cost somewhere between 50 and 80,000. And now that person is asking for six figures and quite frankly, getting it in the market. And so I think um, it highlights one, that there's so much demand out there that we're probably overpaying for talent to some degree. But the other fact is there just aren't any people to do the work. And I think the AICPA recently put out a plan that they recognize that this is a huge gap. Um, they're looking to try and incentivize this industry again and get people back into it. I think you're starting to see the the rules on the CPA exam becoming more and more relaxed to give people more time to, you know, make sure their tests don't expire. So it's not so hard to stay like certified in it or to attract more people. I think, I think it's high. I mean, I think we're seeing all these things that really have recognized that, Hey, this is not something short term. This is not something we can fix tomorrow. And when we have people at the highest levels and the highest organizations that are kind of in these networks of accounting and finance, recognizing these things and, trying to figure out how to incentivize it to get people to come there. I think we realize probably how drastic this this issue is going to become, and it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. I'm wondering, Josh, let's talk about that senior accountant position for just a second. Um, and, and for those who may not be familiar, you know, for a senior accountant, you're talking to somebody, how would you say, Josh, anywhere from like two to five years of experience? Is that about right? Yep, I think so. So... A starting salary for somebody who is going into audit in the big four, maybe, I don't know what, 50 grand ish right now. Is that, is that about right? It, it was five years ago. I think you're like looking at the big four is like 80 to 100 now, honestly, like just that kind of person. And so when, I mean, the, the theory in accounting finance is, hey, let's go into the big four, let's pay our dues. And then when we leave, we'll make twice as much money or so on and so on, mm -hmm. right? Like, or there's a multiple to it. The fact that the big four are having to pay that much money tells you, I mean, the industry has to react to that too, like if you want to bring people out of it. So I that, that's been the biggest surprise to me. I mean, as she's walked me through like the candidates there, I mean, you could have a two-year person that's making $80,000 at like a Deloitte. So if they're going to leave that position, you know, they want 110 plus bonus and all this stuff they ask for the world. And quite frankly, like someone's given it to them. So... I don't know where things stand, honestly. Like, I mean, two, three years of experience to pay that much, it's it's hard to say. Like, accounting is a tough field, and there's a lot of, like, you have to learn a lot of knowledge and technical expertise to operate in it. But that that change has been so drastic from where it was five or six or seven years ago. You know, like, it was just so fast that I'm not sure if that is level set and that's the new norm or if, like, there's going to be kind of a boomerang effect of the, all of this. Well, and I, and I think about the model of the big four firms and audit in particular, where you're actually going to kind of burn through a lot of like senior account, you know, senior auditors and managers. 
But man, when you can make six figures after two to three years of experience, that just does not incentivize you to hang out in the big four for very long, if at all. And and that's why I wonder, like to your point, hey, does this boomerang back? Does this does this have some kind of a whiplash effect somehow? Because you've got to have that pool of senior accountants, basically, and, and managers, because that's how the firms run. So you just well, wonder, like, what is that going to do long term? Well, and then I think there's another factor to consider is like, okay, you've got so much money out there to incentivize people to leave early, like which they're taking, you know, the issue you've got down the road that the other part of this talent, like problem is that we don't, the people that are there don't have the right skills to be there. And so where, you know, you had someone that might've been in public accounting five or 10 years, you know, they, they learned some additional skills there. I mean, a little bit more about management. You know, the big four, they, I mean, they invest a lot in their resources. So, you know, they're trained up a little bit more, but they've just seen a lot more complex issues. Like, and if you get into like transactions and things like that, they had a lot more experience with those. So if they went somewhere, they knew how to do those better, more efficiently to get them right. My concern is everyone's going into industry so fast without some of that technical expertise. I mean, who fills that gap now? I think a lot of it's being pushed to professional services firms. Like it's coming back around and maybe they're happy about that, that the advisory portions are picking that up. But you've got a lack of knowledge and like you've got a gap here of knowledge and technical skills that are also in a market that already has short people. So you're going to like we're going to take this a couple different ways. And like this is why I think it's such a long term problem. It's not just like we have a headcount problem. We have a headcount problem, plus we don't have the technical expertise to actually do what we need to in this space. Listening to the two of you talk, I can see why each of these would be top of mind for CFOs. I don't know if I could have chosen one, and we haven't even talked yet about digital finance transformations. But we'll dig into yeah, that. And on there, Warren, uh, you've like honed in on digital, tr- honing in on that topic a little more? Yeah, we'll get into it. But we'll, we'll take a quick commercial break first. How is a financial reporting team better than a dad joke? A dad joke can tell you what to call a busy accounting leader, but it's not going to tell you why. Really good financial reporting teams can pull together reports that tell you what happened last month and even tell you why. They just don't always have the time to get to the why. That's where Workiva comes in. Top accounting and finance teams are using the Workiva platform to automate financial reporting, from financial statements to board reports, from 10Qs to S1s. Spend less time copying and pasting numbers and more time telling the story behind the numbers with data your auditors can trust. See why accounting and finance teams love Workiva at workiva.com slash accounting. That's W-O-R-K-I-V-A dot com slash accounting. So what do you call a busy accounting leader? Overtaxed. Ugh. Why? I know there's a lot of areas of concern and areas of uncertainty for CFOs. So do you want to talk about how CFOs can turn those into opportunities? What thoughts do you have there? Yeah, I've seen, I mean, anytime recession, uncertainty in markets, all that stuff, like what's so interesting about it is it's all emotional to some degree. Like you never know you're in a recession until you've been in a recession for a long time. Right. And so I think there's a lot of uncertainty because we think we're going to come into one and we haven't, or maybe we have, but we don't realize it, but it has been segmented where certain sectors are still doing really well and others aren't. So some people might be in a recession and some might not, but holistically, I wouldn't like, it's hard to tell that we would all be in a recession at the moment, I think. And so I guess to your question, like I've, I've seen two kind of, I've seen kind of two motions with this that happen is if it's your first time going through this as a CFO and you've never been through a recession, like the first, what they'll do is they'll just freeze spending. Like they'll raise their hands and be like, oh, we think there's uncertainty. We're not going to spend money. We're going to save money for a rainy day. And we're going to do layoffs and we're going to do all these things to like kind of guard our resources. And they go through all this and then things typically aren't as bad as they were forecasting. And so then about six months later, they're trying to hire people back. They're trying to get the engine going again. They're trying to get the business moving. And, you know, they delayed themselves in doing that to some degree where I've seen good CFOs who have been before recognize that there's a trade-off that they do need to guard resources or just spend smarter. But they also look for an opportunity of like, hey, things are down. Where's an opportunity for us to play? What strategy can we change to take advantage of the circumstances 
and they're actually willing to make an investment into things that move forward. And they're the ones who actually benefit from a recession and take advantage of an opportunity and come out the other side better for it. Like they, both companies can go through one on the first one's going to come out with less resources. They're going to play scrappy that are now behind the eight ball where the one that took the opportunity actually probably generated more revenue, created a new segment and is off and rolling and can support the broader business better, you know, from a resourcing standpoint. Do you think, Josh, that all of these things come together with the notion of digital transformation? I mean, I know that that's something that we've talked about a lot, because whether you're talking about being nimble in a recession or dealing with, um, um, you know, new regulation or trying to attract talent by having the work that they do better, higher value, you know, driving satisfaction, that really all hinges down to that. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like that's the panacea for every single problem, but it seems like that's a recurring theme, which then to get back to the survey results went at the very top of the episode, you know, less than a quarter were actually worried about it. But it seems to me like that kind of ends up being sort of a common solution to these and, and many other problems that CFOs are facing right now. Yeah. And if you kind of look at both of these, they're both kind of resourcing problems. Like one is a direct resourcing problem where, hey, we don't have enough bodies to do this to attract people to our company and to make them feel good and make them feel happy here. We can't give them like, um, I want to say this politically correct. We can't give them like non-value add work to do. I really want to say like, we can't give them like work to do. Like they need to, uh, like they need to feel valued. They need to feel like that they're everything they went for school for and everything that they've learned through their experience is being put into use and they're like doing that. So you want them focused on high value work. You want them using their minds. Again, we talked about you have to apply judgment in accounting and finance. Like nothing, it's not just X's and O's. And in fact, it's probably less X's and O's than it's ever been. So there's judgment, there's thought, there's thinking through things. You want them focused on that stuff. Like that's where the real work is done. And so to your point on that one, where we come back to digital transformation, like you've got, you've got to outsource or automate the low value work. Like we don't have head count and we don't have head count with the right skills that we want them wasted on that stuff. So You've got to make that investment in tech, take that off the plate so you can use your resources better. And on the recession point, again, you've got a capacity issue. You're straining resources. What do you want them focused on? Like, do you want them focused on, you know, taking five, like three extra days to close the books? Or do you want to give three days back where your accounting team can be working with your leaders to understand, you know, more in depth on how the business is run and where the opportunities are and where an investment opportunity can be made. So Again, it's all about you've got to shift that work down where you've got people really coming to the table to solve like those bigger ticket problems. And honestly, like we live in an age where we've advanced this enough. Like I, I think when you thought about digital transformation before, it was like, oh, we're just going to automate everything. And I think more and more as we get into this, we realize that it comes in different phases. We automate different pieces, but it's kind of just this ongoing kind of continuous problem that like we find what hurts the most and we figure out what we can apply technology to and get the benefit out of it. We move on to the next one and it's more circular than kind of a linear motion, I think is some of the learnings we've taken out of the past decade on it. Well, interesting insights. And I think it's going to be super, super interesting and insightful to see how this plays out over the next couple of years and to see if the successful CFOs and finance teams were able to pivot in the way that you suggested where they come out stronger versus those who kind of languish because, yeah, they just cut costs or clamped everything down and, you know, then there's an opportunity to grow or whatever and they're not in a position to do that. I think that'll be a really, a really strong indicator uh, about the extent to which they were able to succeed. Um, any final thoughts, Josh, before we uh, wrap up with our closing question? Um, I don't think so. I th well, sorry, let me go back. Yeah, I, a couple of final thoughts. I mean, these are, I think that talent shortage can't be overlooked. Like, that is a real problem. Like, everyone's going to have to deal with this. Everyone's going to feel the pain of that one. I mean, the, the recession, they come and they go, you know, um, and who knows how long we're going to be in it. But it's something to be aware of. It's something to look for opportunities on. But in this accounting and finance space, like, we have a problem. And we're going to have to figure out how to like get people back into this space and willing to do kind of this work. Cause I do think for a long time, accountants have been, I don't know if I would call them trotted down, but you know, they've just kind of been 
behind the scenes cranking away at stuff and they've been overworked and underpaid and you know this is probably their reckoning coming a little bit to kind of level set some of those things but we've also got to figure out um what we need to do to the industry to attract people to like come back in and want to work in this space all right well let's get to our closing question we'll start with you josh can you think of a situation when uncertainty is (laughs) a-okay Um, I'm going to have to cut, maybe, maybe go to Steve first. I'm going right. to have to think on this all a little bit more. So, you, you know what? I love uncertainty when Josh may or may not be at a roulette table. I find that very exciting because I'm living vicariously through him. Uh, and I get to enjoy the successes cause he's generous and, you know, buys food and drinks for people. Or if not, I get to mock him when, uh, he's lost mercilessly. So to me, Catherine, that's when uncertainty is perfectly okay which may or may not have happened multiple times in the past. What? <laughs> you make it sound like I have a gambling problem, Steve. <laughs> I'm not saying well, one way or another. Like... I'm just saying, yeah, if that were to happen, that's when <laughs> uncertainty would be okay. Yeah, you gotta. there's got to be risk and reward to it all. And on that point, I think uncertainty, like that's, I think that's where life is fun. Like change is always happening. Like, I mean, accounting uncertainty, like, yeah. I mean, the market changes, economics change. We all kind of sort through it, but, you know, I think uncertainty kind of brings like salt to life. Like you never know what's going to happen and that it's kind of all about getting the best experience you can and kind of taking those leaps of faith and taking advantage of opportunities when they come, even if they are uncertain, you know? Well, on a serious note, Josh, plus one to that, because I do feel like in life, but even in finance, uncertainty does create opportunity. And so those who are prepared and those who are ready for it, like that's where you can really jumpstart. That's where you can really have massive, massive impacts. That That's kind of like where leaders are born, uh, in a sense. So I, I think you're spot on. Catherine, how about you? I like uncertainty when I'm reading a page turner. I don't want to know what's happening next if it's a murder mystery or something. That's a good one. I feel that way when I'm reading like SEC rules. Uh, you know, accounting standard codification. Like, I just, I don't know. What are they going to say? What's going to happen? So you're the one. That's so, so interesting. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, man. Never a dull moment. Big thanks, Josh Gurge, for joining us. Always good to have you on the podcast. Yeah, I appreciate you letting me come back. If, even if this is the last time, uh, thanks for inviting me back one more time. We'll see how desperate we get for guests. You can stand yeah. by on that. All right. Thank you, dear listener, for surfing along with us. I'm Catherine Sai. That was Steve Soder. This has been Off the Books, presented by Rakiva. Please subscribe, leave a review, tell your buddies if you liked the show. If you're watching this on YouTube, leave us a note in the comments, or feel free to drop us a line at offthebooks at rakiva.com. Surf's up, and we'll see you on the next week. Our editing crew is going to love that one. (laughs)